this is um, American political thought. Um, and I've come to a decision. So this is today is Wednesday, February 17th. I've come to a decision that uh, that the idea of a hour and 20 minute single video lecture would be a crime against humanity since I can summon just enough patience in the morning when I'm brushing my teeth to look at my face for five seconds. I think it would be um, a, a test of human endurance or uh, of human bondage um, to make you listen to that. So I've decided both for this and for the Congress class, which are three hour classes. And since um, the voluntary Zoom session takes up half of our three hour class time, um, what I've decided is to We'll experiment with this. I decided to actually divide the remaining hour and 20 minutes of class time into three modules. Modules. So um, um, I'll try it. We'll see. And it works with this one because, of course, I didn't finish my comments, as I never do um, uh, in the first lecture. And um, and so uh, um You'll see that this this works out well for tonight's or today's material. And so uh, the modules will either be module one, module two, and module three, or module A, module B, and module C. I'll probably refer to them as one, two, and three, but perhaps it may be that, that you're more ethnically attached to letters than numbers. I don't know. I don't know. It's a world, interesting world we live in. So I think I'll probably send you the links listed as module one, module two, module three. For the material for this lecture in which I wanted to sew together um, a couple of loose strands from uh, our discussion on Monday night uh, regarding the introduction and the nature of the class, and then, of course, um, nobody had read the Cropsey article. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. Um, again, the idea that you can make students do anything uh, is, of course, a great fiction. Um, uh, I can't even make students buy the books for class. I can't make them buy the same translations or editions. Vascan Mantun. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire? All right, anyway. So uh, uh, the three modules of this week's class will revolve around the centrality of de Tocqueville to this class. So I'll talk a little bit about, because I never really got to finish why de Tocqueville is so critical for understanding American politics. So I'd like to do that. And then if you, note, if you have the notes from uh, Monday night, those notes will also guide us uh, through uh, these three modules. And um, um, in particular, uh, if you're looking at the notes, I wanted to talk about how uh, what it means to frame a, a discussion of American politics, perhaps even historically, or into three sub categories um, ar around de Tocqueville. And if you're looking at the notes, this is Roman numeral 2A, pre de Tocquevillean, de Tocquevillean, and post de Tocqueville. And I'll explain what those mean. So, um, uh, what I'd like to do is is introduced to Tocqueville. I talked a little bit about who he was um, in the Zoom session, but uh, let me be a little bit more explicit about the book in front of you, uh, if you have in fact purchased the book, which I wanna read to you a little bit. Because again, I, I wanted to um, explain why I have been forcing my students to read this ever since I've been a college professor. And, um, and, and again, uh, as we move through the course and as we move through to Tocqueville, let me just say right now, I think the Tocqueville, as, you, as I'll point out, is probably the most insightful thinker, author, not only on America, but on the nature of modern democracy. And as you'll see, by the way, uh, that's why he came to study this country, as I mentioned on Monday. Um, and you could say, well, what's modern democracy? Well, it turns out that modern democracy uh, is democracy. And democracy is a very old system of government. But in some ways, you could argue that if you're following the Cropsey piece, and if you've had modern political philosophy, modern democracy is ideological in a sense that ancient democracy was not. And that ideology of modern democracy, although, by the way, if you go back to Plato and Aristotle, 
and if you look at book eight in the Republic, where Aristotle or where Plato discusses different kinds of regimes, and he comes to democracy and he says, um, uh, people in democratic societies uh, love equality, they love liberty, they love diversity. Um, so the themes of democratic life have always been a part of democratic political existence and meditation upon democracy. But modern democracy, as you're going to see, uh, is a kind of a refoundation in the same way that all of political life is a kind of refoundation in the modern world. And, and that's part of what, as you'll see when we come to Cropsey's article, um, what you'll learn about American politics. Uh, it turns out that American politics exists against a larger background or a larger whole. And that's what Cropsey is attempting to do. He's trying to make you aware of, um, uh, of uh, the background of American political life not for uh, antiquarian or curiosity reasons, but because he thinks that background is key to understanding the content and unfolding of American politics. So as you'll see, when, when you turn to Cropsey's article in particular, we'll take his, I'll try to introduce you to a way that he thinks in the, as a thinker and an author. Um, I studied with Mr. Cropsey. I, uh, he was at the University of uh, Chicago and I was at Northern Illinois University and he lectured many times at my college. I never had a class with him, but Many of our students, um, the other graduate students in political theory, would often get together in the evening and, and listen to taped recordings of his classes. So I have had Mr. Cropsey in class per se. And I'm particularly fond of his complex and difficult method of writing, which I should also attempt to unpack for you. So the three modules of class, I don't know if I'll succeed in doing this all through the semester, but um, we'll, I'll try to divide them into 40 uh, minute modules so that you can do things like nap, recover, um, get drunk, anything that will help you move on to the next module. And whether or not I do those all in one sitting, I'm not sure. Um, so it will be easier on your eyes and computer screens and on my zip splash. All right. Uh, so a little bit about de Tocqueville. So, so by the way, the three modules will be, the first one will be de Tocqueville. And the second one will be uh, a little bit of introduction to Cropsey. But the main thing, if you're looking at the notes, is I actually want to focus on Roman numeral 3b, the regime. Cropsey's article is the United States as a regime. So obviously, it might be useful. And I, I do this in several of my classes, political theory classes, American politics, American government. Since I'm a political scientist, as de Tocqueville is a political scientist, it's the study of the regime or the constitution. And if you had ancient political philosophy, even modern political philosophy, you know these terms are interchangeable, although they're re rhetorical and also conceptual reasons for settling on different terms to describe the same thing. But the regime is the political system. So uh, since I suggested in my introductory comments on Monday night, the, uh, the ancillary or the uh, circumstantial tie to contemporary American politics, which I'm using for this course, as I explained that I typically, since I came to Congress, I divide this course into the first part, which is the founding, the principles and institutions of American life, how they came into being. Um, the second part is de Tocqueville's take on these. And the third part is the contemporary issue. Now, de Tocqueville's commentary on, on American political life is so vast and so en encompassing, there's almost no contemporary issue that you can't tie back to a de Tocquevillean analysis. And, and again, I've had this conversation with many of my colleagues over the years, my professors and my students. Am I arguing that in order to grasp the nature of American politics, you must read this author? Well, that's a strong statement, but I think, and I think probably most of my colleagues would agree that in some ways, I, I do think that's true. If you really wanna understand what's going on politically in America and understand the unfolding of its national life and the nature of American character, uh, because I do think there is such a thing for reasons you'll see when we talk about the concept of a regime. Um, uh, I do think de Tocqueville is indispensable. In some ways, it, it, that's not such a strange claim, although it is a little unusual since he wasn't an American and he was only, only came to this country for nine months. I would argue you can't understand American public life without reading Federalist 10 and 51 by Madison either or Federal 70 by Hamilton. Um, but it, it's clear that the, the centrality of those authors is self-evident since they were founders and their explanatory and justificatory writings were part of the American founding. 
So to make the case for the indispensability of the Tocqueville, you kind of have to actually um, make that case. It's not self-evident. So with that in mind, let me tell you a little about Alexis de Tocqueville. You can read about it online. You can go to Wikipedia or whatever. Again, he was a young French aristocrat born in 1805, and I gave you the background, and we'll probably talk a little about this when we actually turn to his book in a couple of weeks. Um, I, um, he, um, he had a classical liberal education, and, um, and again, uh, in the 1830s, and just for, to remind you of a bit of historical background, after Napoleon was defeated and the Council of Vienna uh, tried to stuff the Napoleon and the, the political implications and social transformative implications from the French Revolution, the earthquake that refounded all of European politics, perhaps even global politics. Um, uh, um, in 1815, the ruling powers of Europe tried to restore the Christian aristocracy that had been set in place on Christmas Day in the year 800 by Charlemagne with the, with the crowning by Pope Leo III of Charlemagne. And you could say that, that the form of constitutional regime that dominated Europe for a thousand years from 800 to 1800 for convenient date purposes was Christian aristocracy, Christian royal aristocracy. Almost all the nations of Europe were ruled by aristocratic families uh, deriving at least initially on some of the major bishopric families, deriving from the residue of some of the senatorial families in the old Roman Republic, believe it or not. But, but um, once Charlemagne under the Holy Roman Empire kind of resurrected some kind of European unity, all, the, the, again, there, and note, by the way, one way of understanding Catulfus is a point that, that aristocracy, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about what that means, um, was in fact the, the default setting for most of human politics going back thousands of years. The democracy of Athens, the Republic of Venice in the uh, Middle and Post-Middle Ages were great exceptions to the rule. And so aside from like tribal societies, which were relatively small in scale and geographical and popular pop, population scope, um, from really the beginnings of the emergence of ancient political life, up until even the present today, but certainly the modern period, most human politics has been some form of aristocracy, which means essentially, and this is what you must understand, it means they were founded upon the concept of human inequality. Monarchical rule or divine rule, uh, there, and every kind of religious and uh, philosophic justification for the rule of kings, and embodied emperors who were both divine and human or tutored by divinities was the default setting for most human society. Aztecs, Mayans, uh, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Indians, I mean India Indians, the Chinese, the Japanese, uh, and of course Europe. So um, one thing that's important to remember is uh, politics in among humanity was aristocratic up until the modern world. And except for these occasional bursts and exceptions, says it, such as ancient Athens in the 5th century BCE, 4th and 5th century BCE, etc. The Roman Republic, by the way, was, was kind of a republic, but it, it also, like most of the European societies, were actually dominated by uh, wealthy um, and aristocratic elites. Um, so with that in mind, to go back to Tocqueville's situation in um, uh, 1830, Europe had, for a thousand years, was a Christian more royal or monarchical aristocracy. Now, Napoleon, of course, after the chaos of the French Revolution that swept the, in the French monarchy uh, and, um, and the uh, French aristocracy away, almost away, in the bloodbath of the French Revolution, um, uh, the, uh, again, that Napoleon was called by the, the, um, uh, great philosopher, George Friedrich, Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, um, whom we'll talk a little bit about in the Cropsey article, because, uh, Cropsey will ask the question toward the end of his article, have I, with more pain than success, uh, resurrected Hegel? I don't expect an American undergraduate to understand what that phrase means without some unpacking. And thank goodness this 
strange person sitting in front of you right now is here to unpack it for you. So um, anyway, um, so, uh, but Napoleon was defeated. Oh, oh so, so what did Hegel call Napoleon? He called him the armed prophet of the enlightenment that uh, Napoleon had taken, had arisen from the ashes and chaos of the French revolution, but taken those revolutionary ideas and as a world historical figure, ein welthistorischer historisch figure, he had spread the enlightenment forcefully and crammed it down the throats of European societies from Spain to Moscow. But of course he was defeated. The Russian winter defeated him, uh, hubristic under planning and all kinds of things. So the greatest conqueror in world history was defeated and relatively in a short speed, I mean, the parallels to Alexander, Alexander conquered, but then died relatively young. Well, Napoleon was militarily defeated in the War of 1812. Okay, so in 1815, the uh, ruling powers, the surviving ruling powers of Europe thought that that Napoleonic influence and, and the, the forceful uh, entry and spread of democratic political thinking and influence and revolution could be contained, put back in the in the bottle put the genie back in the bottle. Um, and uh, so that's as background. Here's why that's in background. De Tocqueville thought that attempt to stuff the modern democratic genie back in the bottle was doomed to failure, was tragic. He argued that the coming ages would be democratic in the way that the past ages of humanity had been aristocratic. And we will see that, that uh, what that means. What it means to say that America is a democracy or that de dem the future of Europe and the entire world is democratic. And, uh, and to get your interest peaked a little bit, you have to remember that the Tokyo would call democratic, not only our country, but for that matter, the Soviet Union for reasons you'll see, the People's Republic of China, the People's Republic of North Korea, the, uh, the uh, regime of the Nazis and the fascists in Italy. The Tokyo would say all of those regimes are democratic. Now that should puzzle you, uh, young uh, Americans or you young students of modern politics, um, because one of the things you're going to learn in this course is how nuanced and complicated democracy is, as is political life in general, by the way. So um, de Tocqueville became convinced that the great political movement of counter-revolution in his day uh, was doomed to failure and in fact, if pressed, would lead to even greater chaos and tragedy in the coming ages. Because if you tried to stuff the principles of liberty and equality, which the French Revolution and the American Revolution introduced back in the bottle forcibly, you would force them to become even more radical and utopian and destructive of the um, uh, enduring elements of decent society. Uh, which is not a bad description of the French Revolution. Um, and here's a, a, a thought experiment, and I, we could use it in this course, by the way, if we wanted audiovisual materials. Um, you should go see the great 1936, it's available on a million different things, version of Charles Dickens's uh, Tale of Two Cities, um, uh, which is as fine a, to to a comparative study of comparative politics as de Tocqueville is. So it, was, it has great performances. It's a very moving uh, film. And, and for a 1936 film without much access to CGI and everything, it has stirring crowd scenes of thousands of, tens of thousands of participants, plus the moving end of Dickens's um, Tale of Two Cities, where um, Sidney Carton sacrifices his life to save Charles Darnay. And as he ascends the guillotine, he says, "'Tis a far better thing I do than I've ever done. "'Tis a far better rest that I go to than I've ever known." So there, but it would be worth your while to understand the Tocqueville's political universe if you actually watch that film. So uh, why did Tocqueville come to America? Why did he write Democracy in America? Since he was convinced that the leading powers of his generation were locked in this doomed effort to turn back the clock on European democracy. He hoped to come to America because he believed that America was the only place in the world where a stable, successful democracy had actually been established. Now you may contest that designation, 
but you'll see what he means by it. Um, and so um, uh, uh, what he hoped to do was to learn from the lab experiment of America and then uh, write up uh, a massive book as French people are wont to do um, and tutor his generation about the unavoidability of democracy and if he was right, how to be the uh, the um, uh, the birth um, um, midwives. I couldn't think of the word. Uh, instead of uh, having the aristocratic leaders of his generation be tragically involved in the attempt to uh, um, uh, keep a, a European Europe non-democratic, which would then, again, if I may be repetitive, would to total thought would lead to the uh, subsequent emergence of democracy, but in a radicalized and hateful form. Um, uh, he That's what he hoped to do. His enterprise was to learn from America. And by the way, not to have, and, and you'll see this is a critical part of his thought, not to have the rest of the world imitate America, because for reasons you'll see, the total thought that, that um, uh, you can't simply take one form of regime and constitution even if it's successful, and forcibly plant it on another. As you're going to see when I talk about de Tocqueville's, the nature of de Tocqueville's political science, he's both a comma, he's a combination of ancients and moderns. Uh, and, and ancients, you know, as I've already mentioned, Plato and Aristotle initiate the form of the, the science of politics as regime or constitution analysis. And, um, um, and then great modern authors like Rousseau and Montesquieu um, are the great founders of sociology and the idea that that the social culture of a civilization also both makes possible certain kinds of politics, but also limits certain kinds of politics. So the talk was not a superficial advocate of simply uh, taking the American regime or the Constitution and stamping it on other countries, which, by the way, he lived in 1830. And of course, there was a wave of revolution in South and Latin America in which they simply tried to do exactly that. And, and de Tocqueville was even beginning to, wear, to be aware of the fact of how those attempts at Latin American democracy or Central American or, or democracy would fail. And indeed, a century and a half later, uh, uh, he would have predicted the oscillation of, of military dictatorship and, and coup and instability all for an attempt misguided and utopian to simply stick aspects of American politics on um, uh, political circumstances that would not bear it. Now, this will become a very important issue within de Tocqueville, as you'll see. So de Tocqueville came to this country with a young traveling companion, um, uh, Gustave de Beaumont, or Beaumont, I think, not de Beaumont, de in French, by the way, is an aristocratic marker, just like von is in German or van in like Ludwig van Beethoven uh, or uh, Maria von Trapp um, is an aristocratic name marker. Uh, um, so uh, uh, con when he conceived of this great plan, uh, he, remember he was 26 years old um, and he got his traveling companion. Their aim was to come to America, tool around, and then to talk for would write a book about America's institutional life and that Beaumont would write a novel about the social and inner life of America's Americans. And by the way, uh, um, so by the way, they did that. They came to this country for nine months. They went everywhere. They read everything. And all the way from um, the Northeast to the South, um, he over to the Mississippi and up into the middle Midwest, at that point was barely still um, being extracted from French forts, et cetera, still a leftover from struggle, although by 1818, Illinois had become a state and so forth. But essentially, that's where he went. Again, he read everything, the Constitution, the founding, almost all the major writings of the founding. And he came down to France and wrote a big book called Democracy in America. Now, his friend Beaumont also then did fulfill his uh, aim and wrote a novel called Marie uh, about an escaped slave. And I've read portions of this novel. It's very good. Uh, but de Tocqueville, be and, and so by the way, the Marie tells of the effect of slavery as Marie escapes. It's almost like a kind of an Uncle Tom's Cabin or pre pre predecessor of that great novel. Uh, and so uh, 
de Tocqueville became convinced that as that as lovely as that novel was, and as much as it revealed about the social and inner life, the cultural life of Americans, it wasn't part of his plan. So he actually then returned to the project and and then wrote volume two. If you're going to see uh, the, the the textual divisions of democracy in America, volume one and volume two, roughly correspond to the two parts of de Tocqueville's political science, institutions or laws, they almost become symbolic. That is to say the explicit institutional parts uh, of a regime, which, which most of us find very easy to identify. I mean, you can look at almost any country and see, as Aristotle says, the ruling body and the, the ruling structures, the constitution and the politioma, the ruling body, the people in power. But then de Tocqueville also became convinced, as is Plato and Aristotle, by the way, that, that politics, uh, isn't just laws and institutions, it's the larger cultural fabric. And by the way, that's also a Platonic and Aristotelian concept too. So um, uh, so then he wrote volume one, essentially is an attempt to unfold the origins, nature, and the tendencies of American institutional life. Um, volume two, which he subsequently composed, was an attempt to uh, structure the cultural or the larger dim dimensions of the regime. In the Cropsey article, Cropsey distinguishes between the parchment regime and the larger regime. We'll talk about that when we I try to unpack his article. But um, uh, but de Tocqueville uh, uh, bought the same framework and that he realized the first part, which ended with the end of volume one. It's great to be a genius. Uh, and I'm going to read to you from a little bit because that, that passage at the end of volume one, the conclusion, is what changed my life um, and and um, and convinced me to become a political science and a professor of political science, the result of which you can see in front of you. So uh, anyway, um, uh, he the second part then investigates the thoughts, the the feelings, the sentiments, the cultural habits, and the mind of Americans and the likely future of American and democratic society. So um, that's. Democracy in America, that's who de Tocqueville was. By the way, he went on um, to become active in politics, and then don't forget, in 1832, and then throughout the 1830s, and then in 1848, there was a wave of revolution throughout um, Europe, political upheaval, where uh, many monarchies were tempered by constitutional um, uh, democracies or, or legislatures, and uh, and in, 19, in 1848, there was a wave of revolution. And by the way, that's where Les Miserables is, is positioned, which was a more radical wave. And for those of you who have read Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto, it was composed in 1848 in the midst of many of these other. So de Tocqueville became active in politics. He served in the National Assembly for a while, became a little distant, and then he died young in his 50s. So that was that's who Alexis de Tocqueville. We'll talk more about this when we turn to his book. So why why is he so important? I, I talked a little bit about this on Monday. And so uh, let me just say that, first of all, he is the most uh, insightful analyst and describer of American institutions and political life in general as anyone. Um, and, and, and as you'll see, I'm going to make a distinction that we'll come back to when we turn to de Tocqueville. Um, um, the Tocqueville's analysis has two components, what I like to call static and dynamic. Static means uh, it'd be like taking a photograph, a still, versus taking a, an ongoing video. Um, and, and part of his analysis of America is the America that he saw in front of him uh, in 1830, 31. And I will talk about that in terms of how to use a Tocquevillian lens to per periodicize American history. More about that in a minute. So, by the way, what I mean to do is introduce the critical question, is the America that he saw in 1831 the same America that we live in in 2021? Now, of course, the answer to that is yes and no. And so part of the, the, the interpretive task when you're uh, studying de Tocqueville is, is how much of his analysis is still pertinent. And why did he get so much of our political life right from a predictive point of view? And why does some of his predictions go wrong? Again, um, I, I think his analysis of our politics and our characters is still essentially sound and still has predictive value, but not everything that he predicted came true. And so 
one of the things the interpreter has to do is distinguish between how much of his analysis is built on institutional cultural factors in America that don't exist anymore. Now again, uh, then when you come to the dynamic parts, the, the predictive or unfolding parts, um, as you'll see, what enables that prediction to take place is not because he was consulted a crystal ball or everything, but rather what enables you to predict the future of anything um, is if you understand the core dynamics of the process that you are investigating, whether it's weather, whether it's climate change, whether it's the future of a politics. If you grasp the essentials of the nature of the elements of the system that you're trying to study and predict, now don't get me wrong, um, with the exception of Dr. Dunn, no political scientist or historian thinks that he or she is God. Uh, so prediction is not the same thing as pro prophecy. Bear that in mind, but nevertheless, when you come to see the reasons for de Tocqueville's predictions, you'll see, I think, that you are in fact uh, have in front of you, the, as I said, the single greatest analyst and observer of American politics. Second, his political science is, as I mentioned briefly on Monday, a kind of a mixture of um, ancient and modern uh, political philosophy. He combines the analysis, the institutional and, and philosophic analysis of the ancients with a kind of a grasp of modern culture and sociology. He is, he is a political theorist and a political thinker, I don't think he's of the first rank of political philosophers, but nevertheless, as you're going to see, much of what he does can be considered to be a, a reflection almost on the level of philosophy. Um, I would put him up there, probably somewhere between even Madison and Hamilton, who were the most thoughtful American founders, the closest to philosophic analysis that you find at the time of the founding. Although John Adams, all of them, all of them aspired to a trans-political or trans-circumstantial understanding of human nature and politics. But de Tocqueville then has elements of that old ancient institutional study of the regime and of politics with this kind of sensitivity about culture that uh, in, in some ways you get from thinkers like Montesquieu, Rousseau, et cetera. Um, he's both a political theorist and scientist, a historian and a sociologist. In fact, when you talk about the evolution of the modern field of sociology, which now hard to say if the, such a coherent field exists even among ad, ad, the academic world anymore. Um, uh, it's kind of devolved into cultural anthropology or cultural sociology, cultural studies. But it, 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 the Tocqueville is typically listed along with people like Emil Durkheim and Max Weber as founders of modern sociology because much of his analysis is cultural and sociological. But for him, as you'll see, it all exists within the framework of the regime. More about that in our second module. So uh, third, um, he is the greatest theorist. So uh, first, he's the greatest observer and analysis of America. Second, he's a comprehensive political scientist, science who unites critical aspects of both ancient and modern approach to political theory and analysis. Third, here's the third reason for studying him. He's the greatest theorist of democracy. And, uh, and as you're going to see, his turning of the analytical microscope on democracy reveals sometimes not so nice things about democracy. We Americans are so involved in democratic ideology that we think democracy is the measure of a political good. Yet, you don't just have to read Federalist 10 and talk about the tyranny of the majority uh, or, or to have studied the history of the United States between, say, 1880 or um, in World War One, a, a fact which I'll refer to, where in uh, former states of the Confederacy, somewhere between 5,000 or more black uh, African-American men, women, and children were uh, lynched, hung, burned. And, um, and you're going to see that, that that shows the dark underbelly of democracy. So... Um, if you say where in human literature are the most perceptive an analyses of both the great possibilities, but also the great limitations of democratic thought and democratic society, Plato and Aristotle, uh, James Madison and the founders to some degree, as you will see in the ensuing weeks, and de Tocqueville. And, um, uh, uh, and then, by the way, uh, the last major reason, as I said, is I think he is capable of at least revealing some aspects of our political future. Let me do this. Uh, 
Let me read two selections from uh, Democracy in America. One from the conclusion of volume one, which remember when he wrote it in 1831, he thought this was the end of the book. And it wasn't until several years later that he came back and finished volume two. But when I w uh, my first exposure to Tocqueville was in the year 1973. I was a junior in, I had gone through eight different changes of major languages, psychology, I don't know, drinking up until late hours of the morning. And, and so I took a course in American political thought. And now remember what the world looked like to a young person in uh, 1973. If I just asked you, what was the major uh, geopolitical configuration dominating human history at that point in time? All of you would say, I think, the Cold War, the great struggle between the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and the United States of America. So here, a young um, undergraduate junior year first semester comes across the following passages. I hope you bought your books. I hope you bought the edition I asked you to buy. This is on page 412. The Tocqueville now has finished his analysis of American politics and is looking forward to uh, the future. What does he see? And we can tell, we can talk about the details, but listen to this. Therefore, the time must come when there will be in North America 150 million people, all equal one to the other, belonging to the same family, having the same point of departure, the same civilization, language, religion, habits and mores. By the way, everyone pronounces that name more, social customs. Technically, the correct pronunciation is mores. I don't know. I'm not even consistent myself. And among whom thought will circulate in similar forms and with like nuances. And this, of course, was before the internet, even before radio and television. Um, um, all else is doubtful, but this is sure. And this is something entirely new in the world. Something, moreover, the significance of which the imagination cannot grasp. Now, you can quibble. He says, wait a minute. Uh, now, by the way, the idea that America, now, of course, we know that American population is about 100, uh, 300 million, 320, 30 million. But that was a perfect guess from about 100 years from now, from when he wrote uh, the pop. So what he, of course, uh, perceived is that a, the American future would evolve a continental nation uh, encompassing a vast diversity of uh, backgrounds and ethnicities and religions, yet united by common and rapidly evolving American culture. You might contest whether or not we all speak the same language or all, all have the same religion. Uh, we'll talk about that, by the way. But is there an American way of life that, that Americans swim in, even ones who despise the uh, uh, American political experiment? Yes. So let's go on. Now, this was written in 1831. There are now two great nations in the world, which starting from different points seem to be advancing um, and uh, towards the same goal, the Russians and the Anglo-Americans. Now, by the way, in 1831, this was a remarkable prediction because if you said, what's the most powerful country in the world? And of course, in the most powerful empire would have been in the British Empire and the European powers, which of course then eventually uh, committed uh, mutual suicide and destroyed their colonial and imperial regimes in World War I. But, but this was not to say that a hundred years from now, it's gonna be the Russians and the Americans that are contest. This is a remarkable prediction. Now, again, we'll unpack what enabled him to make this prediction, but he goes on. Both have grown in obscurity. And while the world's attention was occupied elsewhere, they have suddenly taken their place among the leading nations making the world take note of their birth and of their greatness almost at the same instant. All other peoples seem to have reached their natural limits and to need nothing but to preserve them. But these two are growing. All the others have halted or advanced only through great exertions. They, the Russians and the Americans, alone march easily and quickly forward along a path whose, eye, whose end no eye can yet see. But he does see it, as you'll see. The American fights against natural obstacles. The Russian is at grips with men. The former combats the wilderness and barbarism, the latter civilization with all its arms. America's conquests are with maybe the plowshare, Russia's with the sword. To attain their aims, the former America 
relies upon personal interest and gives free scope to the unguided strength and common sense of individuals. The latter, Russia, in a way, concentrates the whole power of society in one man. And, and my Russian friends who are astounded when they read this, they say, well, yeah, what do you know? It was true of the Tsar. It was true of uh, Lenin, Stalin, Brezhnev, and Mao. And it's true of Putin. One has freedom as the principal means of action, the other servitude. Their point of departure is different and their paths diverse. Nevertheless, each seems called by some secret design of providence, one day to hold in its hands the destinies of half the world. I'm going to pause here and end module one because it's 40 minutes. In module two, I'll finish my de Tocquevillian introduction and uh, framing of the course and begin discussing the concept of regime. And in module three, we'll turn to Cropsey.